Hi there, I'm Alicia Malone and thanks for staying with us for our 100th anniversary salute to Warner Brothers. Next, our focus is on two-time Academy Award winner Olivia de Havilland, who had great box office success during her time under contract at the studio, but is also remembered for her many battles there. That's because, despite that success, de Havilland felt she wasn't being given great parts at the studio, so she started to refuse some of the roles that were assigned to her, leading to multiple suspensions and the studio unilaterally extending her contract as a result. She eventually took Warner Brothers to court over it and ultimately won the case, a landmark win that was later dubbed the de Havilland Law. Well, up next is a role that Olivia de Havilland did enjoy because it is a great part in a romantic comedy co-starring James Cagney and Rita Hayworth. From 1941, it's The Strawberry Blonde. This movie is one of ten that has been recently remastered in honour of Warner Brothers 100th, and we're showing all ten on TCM this month. It was done through a partnership with our friends at the Film Foundation, an organisation dedicated to film preservation and founded by Martin Scorsese. There are a number of other amazing writers and directors on its board, one of them being Wes Anderson, who graciously agreed to film a special introduction for TCM's presentation tonight. Have a look. Hello, this is Wes Anderson, and welcome to Turner Classics' presentation of Raoul Walsh's The Strawberry Blonde with James Cagney, Olivia de Havilland, and Rita Hayworth, photographed by James Wong Howe. Hey, fellas! Here comes a strawberry blonde. There's almost a little genre of movies made in the 40s especially, which I think expresses sort of Americana type of nostalgia for the uh, last decade of the 19th century, or just after the turn of the century, for the end of the time before automobiles and cinema. I just can't get over that electric light. Isn't it dangerous? No, not if you pay the bills. <laughs> I think of it in relation to movies like Meet Me in St. Louis and The Magnificent Ambersons, Heaven Can Wait. I normally relate these movies to the Midwest, to St. Louis or Indianapolis or, or someplace in, in Ohio, the affluent old neighborhoods with lawns and esplanades. But in the case of the Strawberry Blonde, we're in New York. The immigrant experience is much more prominent, but you still have the college men and the glee clubs and dentists ah! and barber shops and sarsaparilla and spittoons that I think of in the world of those films. When are you ever going to win a fight? Biff doesn't want to spoil his record, do you, Biff? Hey, hit me with a spittoon. It's set about 50 years before it was made. I mean, it is in the form of a flashback within that context. And the music of the time is very important in the film. The nostalgia for that music, the popular songs of the moment, which I guess some of the audience members would have remembered when those songs were new and popular. Meet Me in St. Louis. And the band played on. The title of the movie, The Strawberry Blonde, comes from that song. Hey, she would waltz with the strawberry blonde and the band played on. Roll Walsh, I understand, considered this one of his best films, if not his best. It's a Warner Brothers movie around the time of High Sierra and the Maltese Falcon, and it's quite a different kind of film from those. I think Walsh and Cagney, they say, we're both looking to do something quite different, a comedy with no gangsters, and this is it. Oh! Oh! There's a great innocence that's sort of dramatized in the film. There's a wonderful long scene in a park with James Cagney and Olivia de Havilland where they sort of fall in love. How is you haven't got a date tonight? Free thinkers have a lot of time on their hands. We're presented with Olivia de Havilland as a middle class woman, a nurse. Unusual for her. She sort of pretends to be a suffragette. The tyranny of man over woman. The stupid convention that says a woman shall wear such and such. She smokes a cigarette, but it turns out she's never lit one. She isn't so bold or advanced as she pretends to be, and it's an interesting glimpse of a massive social change before it's occurred, and it's presented as naive from the perspective of a time we now consider naive. I think my favorite performance is not even Cagney's, it's Olivia de Havilland, who is wonderful in the film. Are you glad to see me? You know I am, man. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I do. This is Wes Anderson for Turner Classic Movies.
This was a breakthrough film for actress Rita Hayworth, who played the title character. Warner Brothers borrowed Hayworth from Columbia Pictures after Anne Sheridan, a contract player at Warner's, refused the role. Hayworth made quite the impression on audiences and critics, returning to Columbia as a bankable star, but it was Olivia de Havilland as Amy who stood out for many, with Time magazine stating that both James Cagney and Hayworth gave wonderful performances, but the dark-eyed Olivia de Havilland takes it away from both of them. Even writer-director Wes Anderson, who provided tonight's intro for the film, shared that de Havilland's performance is his favourite of the picture. De Havilland had three films in theatres that year, 1941. In addition to The Strawberry Blonde, she gave what became her second of five Oscar-nominated performances in Hold Back the Dawn for Paramount and then appeared with her frequent Warner Brothers co-star Errol Flynn in a film like ours that was also directed by Raoul Walsh, They Died With Their Boots On. Up next, Olivia de Havilland returns in another romantic comedy, this time from 1943 with an Oscar-winning screenplay written by Norman Krasner, who also directed and co-starring Robert Cummings. Stay with us.